Okay, well, we are live. Thank you very much for everyone that has joined our panel today, as opposed to the one that Richard Saskin is delivering in parallel. So I promise you, you, you learn more practical stuff with that. So I, I love Richard. Uh, I'm joking, obviously. Um, you know, if uh, if our emails have not been blocked by spam settings, you're, you're here with us uh, and you're here with uh, Net Documents, uh, who are partnering with us for, for this webinar. Uh, we'll be talking today about uh, becoming a firm of the future, adapting to a rapidly changing landscape. Uh, we've got a fantastic panel um, today. Uh, we've got Morris uh, Tani joining us, who is a director at uh, Technology and Innovation at Keystone Law, uh, a full blown, fu fully blown remote firm for, for quite a few years now. So he will be telling us uh, how they have been uh, leaping ahead while everyone was trying to figure how to operate in the last three months. Uh, we've got Ed Turner, a managing partner at uh, Taylor Vinters, uh, an international uh, firm with uh, offices in the UK and Singapore. Um, and we've got Charles Dryson, uh, who is a consultant and former partner at Harrison Clark, uh, Rickerbees, and now working in uh, exciting high-tech uh, organization uh, having to do with robotics and of course last but not least we've got uh, Peter Buck who is uh, VP product strategy at uh, net documents and of course myself um, Timo I, I run cosmonauts I run a bunch of other stuff and uh, probably some of the events that uh, you would have been attending if there wasn't a lockdown uh, this year uh, before we proceed with um, our um, virtual panel or, or round table, if you wish. Uh, we'll be having uh, Peter and Maurice uh, delivering a short presentation for us today. Uh, so the presentation will be built for the future now, how systems and ideas enable leading firms to adapt in uncertain times. Uh, over to you, uh, Peter and Maurice. Thanks, Kimo. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's fun to be with everybody. Uh, I think I'm going to throw up some slides. Not sure I can see those uh, yet, but um, always a treat to uh, be on the same channel with uh, Morris and some of the magic that he's um, done at Keystone. So I think the goal today is to sort of frame the discussion at the beginning around uh, platforms that were in place. Maybe some organizations work with foresight, some with hindsight, some with a combination of both. And I think a Keystone and Net Documents are fortunate to, to have been in position uh, to be working a little bit for foresight, distributed environment that Keystone and Morris will explain, and the cloud services global platform that Net Documents delivered. So Morris is going to start, and then we'll go back and forth, and then we'll bring in the panelists. So Morris, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Peter. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the time out. So uh, I suppose the best way of um, setting the stage is to, is to explain a bit more about Keystone Law for anyone that, that doesn't understand how we work and who we are. So we're a, a traditional law firm in that we offer legal services to our clients. Um, uh, but that's pretty much where the traditional sort of stops in that we're not a partnership. We are a business. We are a a company run by a board of directors who are all experts in their field and um, not by sort of partners who've worked their way through the through the business um, and they it's it's an aim listed company so um, we listed about two and a half years ago now and um, fortunately the share price is is, is still doing well um, but it's 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 different in that it's we provide a platform all of our lawyers are are self-employed lawyers they they come to us with their business and we provide them with the platform on which to operate the, the systems the 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 processes and the people so that they can run their businesses uh, as effectively and as efficiently as they can and um, it's a it's an eat, eat what you kill model in that whatever the lawyer earns they keep 75% and we keep 25% and for that we provide them with obviously the the amazing IT systems but the the marketing the branding the 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 platform on which they can operate and most importantly the the professional indemnity insurance that's a very expensive uh, item for someone trying to to start a business on their own 
Um, but most importantly for them, it's, it's, it's the brand and feeling part of a firm, even though they are self-employed and, and, and uh, working in a, in a sense on their own. Um, but the, 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 the biggest differentiator for us, and, and I guess part of the reason why I'm speaking today is, is that all of our work, lawyers work wherever they feel comfortable. So um, they are not in, uh, in big shiny offices in, in city centers. Um, they are working from home, from a, a garden office, from clients' offices, uh, from some of the slightly more annoying ones are working from their holiday homes in, in Spain and in Italy. But it, it's, it's a firm where there's no hierarchy, there's no politics, because the lawyers are coming to us with, with their own practice, but then we provide them with the framework and, and the, the tools in which, in which they can operate. So that's just sort of setting the stage and, and setting the scene of, of how Keystone operates, which obviously has then defined how we've built the IT environment. So knowing, uh, knowing how lucky we are in that we've only been going sort of 15, 16 years, that we haven't had to, to inherit a bunch of legacy software that sort of has to be patched together. We were able to, to, to look at the landscape and, and choose tools that we felt were, were, were going to work for a, a workforce that was not sort of centrally based. Um, so we defined some guiding principles. We uh, made sure that everything we were going to choose had to enable people to work anywhere, anytime, but they had to be secure. They clearly had to be cloud first. They had to be scalable so that we could we could grow rapidly. Um, and then they had to be user friendly and, and, and flexible. So with that sort of in our in our backpack, off we went and had a look at the market. And what we did was we looked at, at, at sort of best of breed products for what we felt they needed. And then when we didn't find something that that would work for them, we decided to build stuff. So um, there's sort of four key areas of, of our sort of IT table. The first being the Microsoft Office Suite, which obviously everyone has access to. Um, then there's Microsoft Teams is the second leg of the table, which um, enables them to collaborate um, internally and externally. Um, and the third leg of the table is, is net documents, which obviously uh, uh, Peter can tell you far more about, but it was something that we found very easy to select because it ticks all the boxes for us. It, um, it enabled everything that we needed to do. It enabled the lawyers to work remotely, securely, um, collaboratively, and, and in a user-friendly and flexible arrangement but really scalable. So we took on, I think, 100 lawyers last year, 65 of those senior lawyers and 35 of those sort of more junior lawyers that those senior lawyers have, have brought on board because they've their practice is starting to grow. Um, and it, it takes 10 seconds to, to add them to the Net Documents platform. But the flexible side came up very quickly with Net Documents. We found that some of our lawyers we're based in quite remote areas. I'm in Kent with four mega broadband, so if we cut out, um, apologies. But um, we found that they were in remote areas, but also on the road a lot. So having the, the cloud access to, to, the, to the main net documents platform um, was sometimes tricky. So what we, we had a chat with, with net documents and they said, oh, well, we've got a, a, another area of, of the product called ND Sync, which allows you to, to save your files uh, locally and then it syncs back to the to the cloud as and when they've got internet connections. So it had that flexibility that we needed. So that there's this sort of two different flavors of net documents, and yet still we're happy because the documents are secure and compliant and stored centrally, and the lawyers are happy because they've got access to the documents whenever they need them. And um, the fourth leg of the table um, is is something that we we felt there wasn't a product in the market that met the needs that we needed, which was to, to provide the nose to tail uh, sort of s software for the lawyers to, to do everything else they needed to do. So that's where we went away and, and built something. Um, and uh, I'll show you more about that and talk to you more about that in a minute, but that's something that we've called keyed in. Um, but uh, yeah, those are the, the four legs of the IT table. Um, and I'll come back to you in a minute on, on the keyed in. Back to you, Peter. That's great, Morrison. Uh, Timo, if you don't mind just going back one slide. I think the reason that we brought this team together and why we wanted Morris to share the story of Keystone is about this notion of, of, of business foresight. 
Um, and the idea of Net Documents as a global platform supporting hundreds of thousands of daily users and uh, accepting onboarding millions of files daily um, with really interesting analytics on top of that. Uh, a fun fact uh, that we collect almost uh, 30 billion signals every single day so we can look at things like how is performance in an outlying region? Uh, what is user behavior? And we'll share some of those behaviors just in a, in a minute, which I think is quite fascinating. But I guess at the end of the day, the, the point of the story is that every millisecond does count. Um, and then when we are in a full swing of remote work, that becomes important. Um, and so we think that document management is digital currency in these uncertain times. You know, without a source of truth, the source of truth that's delivered via the cloud, um, it becomes uncertain. Um, that source of truth to support business, transactions, regulatory investigations will simply stop. Um, and it's ultimately about digital work that has to be both simultaneously porous and secure. Porous, is, uh, as Morris mentioned a second ago, related to ND Sync, being able to securely work offline, yet have that content protected um, uh, remotely and as it ventures back to our platform. And secure because compliance and good information governance mandates it. You know, porous because those boundaries between business partners as uh, Ed and Charles do work, they need to be able to uh, deliver those solutions to their business partners and it can't be encumbered by complex on-premise software. So that's how we sort of thought this group would come together in kind of an interesting way. The reason that we're sharing um, um, the last slide was to show at the fact in this complex times, revenues and growth continues to be stable. Our second quarter uh, of this year was our fifth best quarter um, uh, in the company's history, in part because the cloud and the platform uh, is ready. The other thing, and I know we'll talk about this in the panel in just a second, is the behaviors we saw. I, mean, I mentioned all of the um, analytical data we collect on our platform. And we did a lot of surveys. It was interesting at the time of the lockdown, 92% in Europe and 87% in the United States and North America were productive within 24 hours. I thought that was a great uh, testimony to a platform that allows you to be agile and move in business ways that you might have never anticipated. The other interesting point was that um, the number of amount of user productivity or number of transactions on our platform, you can see the millions of transactions we do uh, daily, that transaction volume went up. It's up uh, over 20% uh, um, in the first uh, four weeks and it stayed at, at about 15% um, um, on the ongoing months, which I think is fascinating. That just means to our view, the platform accommodated the change in patterns, not change in patterns that. Uh, Morris's Keystone team sees every day, but many of our other customers. And there are two little interesting facts. And I'd, I'd be curious if we get to the panel later, later if they see this and those uh, listening online see this, is that um, after a normal work hours, we saw additional three hours per day of activity on the platform sustained uh, throughout the week. And then Sunday, which was traditionally a, a, a waterfall day, meaning the business activities would drop off uh, significantly, uh, they uh, have come back as a, re a, a very strong, productive uh, day of the week. Um, so uh, I think we, we call it Swiss cheese that, you know, as uh, the days change and our demands change, the platform seems to be able to uh, accommodate that. So I think that's fascinating. And we'll come back and talk about a few other things, but the last point I wanna make just about where we are with the platform, and this ties back to uh, Keystone's strategy around Microsoft Teams, is that um, um, last month we released ChatLink, which allows you to integrate net documents within uh, Microsoft Teams so that workspaces and documents can live alongside conversations. And that's a big investment area, and we're gonna continue to drive resources in that demanded by uh, many customers, um, and that's easy for our platform to respond to that. The other point I wanna make, and I think we're gonna cover this a little later um, in the chat, is around market forces and the demand for efficiencies. I think Ed and Charles will talk about this from their perspective um, as a lawyer, that efficiencies in the legal sector, including what I call monitoring, guiding legal work to completion, 
We have a set builder product that facilitates teams to collect and organize and publish groups of documents, you know, frequently called deal Bibles. That's been a really popular product. I mentioned statistics earlier. Our um, real-time communication product called Ta uh, called Thread, that had 138, 140% increase in utilization, much like Microsoft Teams, this part of our platform. And then finally, I wanted to make a, a point around a product that we're just finishing work on and um, early adopter customers will begin using it uh, next month and it's called Tasks. And we looked at Tasks uh, many months ago as a way, as we're in this completely new digital uh, world, this digital currency I mentioned, allowing documents to be associated with repeat work, with activities required to complete a legal representation, complete a transaction, complete a project. So that those tasks can be easily rendered into a series of steps and associated documents. So the idea of the platform being able to adapt to these different needs, Keystone's needs to deliver a distributed environment, other global firms needs to have a consistent practice around document closings and around uh, transactions supported by our upcoming task modules, just means that it makes it easy to organize and manage documents, these, this new digital currency in this new world of remote work. So it's fun to be able to see how customers use it, fun to see some stories and how Keystone uses it. So I think, Morris, back to you, and let's have a look at uh, at Keyed In. Yeah, thanks, Peter. So uh, I mentioned earlier that the four legs of the IT table, so the fourth leg being Keyed In. So Keyed In is, is uh, something that we um, had to build from scratch. It's something we used, um, so the latest technology, and it's, it's something that we haven't just built rolled out and gone right that's great we're going to sit back and 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 uh, and hopefully everything will be fine it's 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 always it's a constant work in progress we we worked with the lawyers we we tried to understand how they wanted to work and what we tried to do was not sort of pit, force people to work in a certain way we we realized that different lawyers work in different ways so we we made sure that we built a, a platform that enabled everyone to work in the way that they wanted to work so it, it was flexible enough that it accommodated different working styles um, and within keyed in and um, they are able to do everything they need to do so they can time record they can create clients and matters they can uh they can run reports they can create bills and um, everything on one platform that's on a secure platform that they can access either from their laptop or from from their mobile device Clearly, there's a slightly more limited real estate on a, on a mobile device, but some of the, the fundamentals that they need to do all the time, they're able to do. So an example of, of the flexibility. So, for example, time recording. Some lawyers are, are very keen to, 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 to use timers and start and stop and, and see exactly where they are at all times, whereas others are prefer at the end of the day to to. to add in the times that they spent on each on each activity. And then there's others that do that at the end, end of the month. They keep a, a rough track on, on a spreadsheet. Uh, clearly not the right way to do it, but it's the way some people do it. Um, and then they they can do a mass upload. So we've built the, the platform to to accommodate different ways of working. Um, and as I said earlier, it's 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 a work in progress. We're constantly updating it. We're taking feedback from from existing lawyers and probably in a way more importantly new lawyers who've come from from other organizations where they might have used a very different tool set and gone oh it's really great if you could do this or if you could add that bit of functionality and the great thing with with having a bespoke platform is we're able to to accommodate that and and we have a development team that um, are absolutely fundamental to 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 the to the running of the business and they can adapt to the, the product to to to, to fit um, and the other thing we do with Keydin is is we always make sure that we're conscious of of saving time for the lawyers. So uh, little things uh, on the client creation, for example, um, we've built an integration with with Companies House. So if um, they are adding a client that is a limited company, rather than having to type in all the details of that limited company, that's already available on Companies House. So we have a real time API, and it looks for the name of that company, pulls that information back, 
populates it on the screen and it saved the lawyer probably only two, three minutes of time, but time is money in their world. And more importantly, it's, it's the data integrity. You know that that data has already been uh, ratified by the company's house. Um, and there's also extra information. There's company director information, there's key contacts within that organization, all great data that we can pull back and, and, and use um, within, within, the, within the matter information. Um, and other sort of quick wins, um, we've uh, integrated with a product called Signable um, for electronic signatures. So a lawyer can literally start, um, create a client and matter uh, and start recording time within probably about five minutes. Um, and, and with that, they've also sent out an electronic uh, engagement letter to their client and, and they can carry on working. Clearly, they can't bill that client because there's there's money laundering and, and conflict checking and and that's going on in the background. We've got a team um, that is doing that for them. So it, it's all about efficiency. It's all about trying to save the lawyer uh, time and effort so that they can just focus on what they love doing, which is it, which is being a lawyer. So um, there's a very quick video we've put together. It's it's a couple of years old. So um, uh, hang on one second, Timo. <laughs> um, it is a couple of years old, so um, we have adapted it since, but it just gives you a brief snapshot of, of the kind of functionality that we've built into Keydin. Um, apologies in advance for the music, um, but uh, here you go. This was the complex engagement letter, Morris. We gotta wait a second. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's go with that. Yeah. I think the beauty of the platform, and it doesn't show, um, it shows great um, um, in person and in this video, was the idea of we're officially in the digital era. And I think Keystone, with your thinking around remote work and with the keyed in platform doing the mundane and making it a digital transaction, um, I think is the big the big lesson, the big takeaway that I think of every uh, one of our customers is talking about and doing at some level. I was talking to um, um, innovation officer at one of our big global uh, clients and they said, finally, we're in the digital era and now new work and new ideas can emerge. So I think keyed in is a perfect example uh, of that. So yeah. yeah. Thanks, Peter. And, and I think the great uh, litmus test for that is that COVID has had zero impact on, on our lawyers' ability to work. Um, they've just obviously productivity levels in different areas has been affected. But in terms of their ability to, to, to do their work, um, yeah, nothing has changed and we haven't had to make any changes uh, in order to, for that to happen. So I think, Timo, it's probably sensible to, to not go with that video again, I guess, um, and uh, move on from there, really. I, I, I'm I, I happily go through it. We had a small technical issue. Uh, it's all actually, Morris. I quite enjoyed the music. So if you guys don't mind, <laughs> play the video once more, and then we're gonna dive into the panel.
Ooh, it seems like we are uh, yep. getting. I think, I think company company secrets. I can't I can't allow you to show any more. Yeah. <laughs> well, Timo, we got so much other good stuff, and with Charles and and Ed, um, Morris, any any last thoughts about sort of how you've completed that chapter and that foundation? Um, I know yeah. we'll some in the in the panel, but any last thoughts? Well, I think obviously going out and throwing your entire IT estate in the bin and starting again is clearly not a an option for people. But I think all I would say is is if your systems aren't sort of cloud ready, just start that journey because the rewards are there to reap, um, and it enables your workforce to to be a lot more uh, productive in whatever environment that they want to work in, which clearly. Uh, in the, the annoying phrase, the new normal is is likely to be the way everyone's going to be working going forward, or certainly in a lot more. Yeah, it makes sense. I think the lesson we keep taking away is that the, many of the tools have existed, an environment, uh, however sad, has framed um, a need for those tools and different levels of both usage and competency. So I think platforms matter. Picking them matters, um, communicating them, and coming up with new ideas how to use them also matters. So, all right, Timo, over to you, and let's have some fun. Thank you very much. I think that uh, if more uh, people adopt uh, drum and bass to their uh, corporate or, or product videos, uh, it will be a much nicer world, like uh, all in all. Uh, apologies once more for uh, for the fact that you know we had a bit of uh, hiccup with uh, showing the whole video, but. Um, keep in mind that we'll be circulating the recordings from today and we'll ensure that the video will be circulated along uh, uh, along with uh, the recording of the panel today. Uh, once more, um, I'll quickly introduce our, our panel. Uh, so we've got uh, Maurice, who is Director of Technology and Innovation at Keenstone Law, uh, Peter, VP Product Strategy Net Documents. Uh, we've got uh, Charles Dryson, a consultant, former partner at uh, Harrison Clark uh, Rickerbys, and we've got Ed Turner, managing partner at uh, Taylor Winters. Um, the topic today is uh, looking at how uh, you know companies are progressing through uh, becoming a firm of the future, uh, if you wish, uh, some some future that was uh, envisioned by by organizations such as Keystones, and some that were forced. Through, through that change, uh, willingly or, 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 or not so. Um, so the first, uh, the first question that I've got to the panel um, is related to how well equipped most uh, big law firms are uh, in terms of remote working. Um, and uh, is remote working um, actually providing the, the ability to uh, remain uh, at optimal capacity and not optimal effectiveness. Um, I will actually start with um, you, Ed, on, on that one. Uh, it would be interesting to understand uh, how Taylor Winters has been kind of pushing through uh, the last few months, whether you, you feel that you have been at optimal capacity and effectiveness. Okay, thanks, and thank, thanks, guys, for for the presentation. It was really, really insightful and and um, useful to me as a non technologist um, to hear that that perspective that that was kind on us um, on us Luddites. Um, so I think the way I the way I see the transition for us. So we we were a largely office based business, and I don't think we represent the views of, of big law as such. I mean, that the, we're a relatively small organization of, of 150 people and a 20, 22 million pound turnover. Um, but well, for me, the, the issues are a combination of both technologies. They're so about facilitation, but they're also as much about, about culture. And, and in some senses, as a leadership team, what the last four months has taught me is, is the, the huge number of assumptions that we were making that were getting in the way of our progress. So, um, you know, assumptions about what our lawyers wanted, assumptions about what our clients expected, assumptions, um, and probably a, a degree of uh, a degree of complacency in the sense of we had we we as an organisation had focused very much in the last ten years in in transition on uh, in focus and identity. So, um, focusing our business from a from a 
regional multi-service, multi-client platform to a to an international business focused on the innovation sector. So we were making the transition, the, the changes and the progress that we were making seem to to be there for us in terms of what we could do with 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 focus, with culture, with identity. And therefore, in some senses, uh, the the way we worked and a technology that supported that was always something which was following that. Or, you know, contrast that to Keystone, where clearly the, the technology platform has facilitated the entire business model very effectively. So I think in, in some senses I can look at I could analyze the last four months in terms of the problems and challenges. But actually, I think what it's done has been a it's been a huge eye opener and an opportunity. And it's, it's moved us forward um, in accelerated the progress down down a path that we were traveling. I was um, I, I'm pleased to say that we are on the journey towards cloud. We're not there. But I suspect you know, we're already having conversations about how that journey is now going to be foreshortened by, I would have thought, at least 12 months um, from where we were probably we are probably, by the time we procrastinated and fannied about a bit more with it, probably a couple of years away. But, uh, you know, we're, we're even looking at whether we can do that in, in six months now because the transition we've achieved in the time. Now, I still think that that step for us, the, the way I look at it now, is that there is the basic can I operate in a, in a um, remote environment? That's a relatively easy one. I think most law firms have made that transition. It's now about um, making that, an elegant way of working and integrating it with um, with the with the office environment as well because I don't see us moving towards a fully remote setup. I can absolutely see us resisting going back to a fully office based setup, and I think where we'll hopefully end up is in a in a happy hybrid where we undertake the tasks that are best carried out in a collaborative um, shared environment in that in the office. Um, and and the task which can equally well be carried out um, solo at home um, with with the use of tools to be able to collaborate with um, uh, clients with uh, uh, other uh, partners and um, uh, with our clients um, carried out at home because then that you know for, for the reasons for the business for for the for society for for the environment you know we've just the, the last four months has just been a slap in the face to us all I think and just said actually guys. You know, enough's enough. Let's 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 move forward. So I I I kind of funny funny enough characterize it the last four months not as not about the challenges of remote working, but actually the opportunity of remote working. And on uh, that note, um, I'm actually sharing a really interesting paper now uh, via via the channel that was provided by the colleagues uh, at Net Documents. Uh, please uh, look at it while while you can. It's uh, titled "Why Cloud uh, on." Uh, follow, follow, follow as well from what you were just uh, touching on there, uh, Ed. Um, you know, over to you, Maurice. I, I, I want to ask you whether uh, you feel that uh, you had a strong competitive advantage at the beginning of, uh, of, of the lockdown compared to, to some of the kind of more standard setup uh, legal firms. I suppose it depends how you define competitive advantage. Uh, in terms of the ability for the lawyers to to, to work effectively, yeah, I mean, uh, clearly our systems are designed for that. But as Ed was saying, uh, organisations have adapted very quickly. Um, it's been a fantastic um, sort of catalyst for for IT directors to to be able to to push through the changes that they've been begging and pleading for 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 a number of years now. Um, so in terms of competitive advantage, no, I wouldn't say so, no, because the legal service that we provide is still as effective as the legal service that other firms provide. Um, in terms of going forward in the competitive advantage, yeah, I think if, if firms don't adapt, I think people are realizing that they, as Ed said, that they can work effectively from home. So if if they are forced back into the office, then I think yeah, we'll have a lot more people knocking on our door saying, okay, uh, my firm doesn't want to facilitate that. I'm, I'm really enjoying being at home, spending time with my family and working when I want and how I want. And so, yeah, if, if firms don't adapt, then, yeah, then I think we will definitely have a, a competitive advantage. But I, I hope that they will, in a way, I hope they don't adapt, but clearly they will. 
<laughs> Thank you for that. And, and, and Peter, um, has requirements related to the systems that you provide changed or altered in any way uh, in, in the past four months? Like, what were the type of requests that people uh, come, come to you with? Well, I think the big theme, and I mentioned this in the opening remarks, is what we term workforce continuity. There was this concept before of business continuity. If something breaks, you want to make sure it still works in a redundant site. But workforce continuity, I think that hits on Ed's comments around there's going to be this, uh, as I mentioned earlier, porous world that you're working, doing some work at home, some work at the client, some work in the office. And so now as a technologist, I'm happy to see that, you know, there's going to be better leverage of those tools and the rise of things like our thread product and the Microsoft Teams uh, product. So I guess, but one of the demands we continue to see is the ability to exclude and include locations that can access our service. And one of the things that our service provides for uh, customers to do directly is those lists, those include and exclude uh, lists. And that little minor things like that are thoughtful that cause you to adapt the platform um, and it should be part of your work, not something that um, is uh, dictated because whenever it has to be compelling enough to be used. Awesome. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, and of course, Last but uh, but not least, Charles. I know that um, you know we we discussed previously with you that you know, the the answer to to what what the future requires it's it's not one one or the other. You know I know that uh, kind of feel that the hybrid uh, um, like way way of working where you have the opportunity to work in the office but also have the opportunity to work from from home. It's kind of what probably uh, the future should look like. Can you can you elaborate? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, IT made its promise, didn't it? When COVID came down, the fact is that most organizations were able to carry on working. But I wouldn't want to extrapolate from here into the future and use this as a base because, well, the problem with remote working is it's remote, right? And And being remote is not generally a good thing in my mind. I mean, it's flexible, good. Being able to work where you're needed, good. Being able to work where you're needed is good where you choose. But but this concept of being remote, remote from colleagues, remote from clients, you know, nobody wants all that. So what they do want is the, is the flexibility of it. So I worry about the, the correlation between the IT and the remoteness. I hope that IT doesn't drive remoteness. I hope it enables the flexibility, enables deliberate choices, and it enables us to make a choice that I'm going to work in the office because I want the interaction with my colleagues today. And I've made some deliberate choices along that lines recently where we've been really glad to see each other. Or I'm going to go and spend some time with clients. I mean, I've had periods in the past where I had six or seven weeks in the US. Um, and the ability to do that is important. So it's not that I want to be remote. I just want to be able to make those deliberate choices and, and have the facility to do that. So for that reason, I don't think um, I don't think remote working is is optimal it, it's a necessary function in what we have now but i don't think it's a an end that we would drive to but i think there's room for all i mean the, if you know a lot of maurice's lawyers for example your, your lawyers maurice are quite experienced lawyers mostly there's a lot there's a higher number of senior lawyers and some of those will be making again deliberate choices about things that suit them but equally you know i've got colleagues at harrison clark rickabies who are just starting out in their career they'll be trainees they'll be paralegals they'll be more junior solicitors and they've made a deliberate choice to be in a in a firm where they get that interaction and they actually are missing the fact that that they're remote. So sure, they're all, you know, the, the, that generation wants to see the advent of technology. They want the flexibility like the rest of us, but they don't want it to the exclusion of what the good things were before. They want both. I think in future, that's what technology will deliver. Yeah, and I think um, just, just jumping in there, I think you're absolutely right. And I think... One thing I, I haven't made clear is that even though all of our lawyers are remote, we have a number of, of social um, uh, events because of exactly that, because the lawyers want to have adult conversations. They want to, to, to share their views. They want to meet other lawyers. And again, there's, there's, a, there's a business interest for them as well, because with our model, you if you refer work, you get a percentage of the work that they do for you, but you're not going to refer work to someone you don't know, you don't like, you don't trust. So we have a lot of 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 social face to face meetings, obviously not at the moment. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, sort of collegiality is still fundamentally important. Um, the technology can only go so far um, to, to provide that the collaboration side of things. You still need 
sort of face-to-face -face, uh, contact. Um, so yeah, I, I think your point is ex extremely valid. But Charles, it's interesting on your point about remote work, if you don't mind me jumping in, is that there was an interesting study that uh, H uh, HBR and Microsoft just did around sort of the demographics of the world today. And I shared some of those thoughts on our platform. But one thing I think is interesting is that um, um, people are more likely, almost 2x uh, more likely to turn on their video cameras now and have a, a discussion, I think, interesting. Norway and the Netherlands are leading that, probably 60% more likely in the US, uh, about 40% likely uh, to turn on their video cameras. But I think the point is that that engagement is different. And I think we're hearing from some customers, even how they're thinking about bringing on new team members, they're hiring more for team characteristics as opposed perhaps for hero characteristics. So I think there's some interesting uh, currency changes um, there. Yeah, and the ability to work interactively at a distance, I'm going to use that word rather than remotely, uh, with the technology. I mean, that's plainly come on leaps and bounds. I mean, the you know, the facility we've got now, but particularly the screen sharing, the collaborative drafting tools, you know, they and they, those are, are clearly great. And even if you're in a, I mean, for example, my firm is a multi-office firm, you know, frequently we have had to collaborate with people in other offices. You know, those are, are great for that too. But, and with the interaction with the clients, it's not just with the colleagues, you know, being able to, do that stuff in real time, see somebody, but also see the document emerging if, you're, if it's a document you're working on. Uh, those are those are nice features, and I think those are great, and those will undoubtedly continue. But to be fair, we use those in the office too right. when we were there. You, yeah. you want them wherever you are. You know, you just want yeah. that choice about venue to be independent of technology, and you want the technology to enable the right choice. So I was going to dive in and make the point that I think framing the conversation around technology here as just a question about location is probably not doing it justice that in reality what it's done is made us realize that there are a whole bunch of questions being asked about the way that we worked whether we sat next to each other or whether we we sat in completely different locations and um you know a lot of the issues that we're thinking about are about the and and so it's been really interesting hearing um uh, morris talk about uh, the experience at keystone but it's about transparency of allocation of work. It's about um, the supervision and in matter supervision and insight around what's happening. It's about collaboration with clients. You know, I think clients don't want to feel that they're over there in a in a different space, like physically and metaphorically. They want they want to be collaborating with you in a safe space that they can come to. Um, with you as their advisor and with any other advisors who are relevant to the particular, um, you know, event, issue, transaction, strategy, whatever it is that they're seeking your input. So I think a lot of what we're, a lot of what we're seeing, and I think what we will see in, in, in very fast evolution of the adoption and development of technology in, in, in the next couple of years will, will not just be about location. It will be about the way that we work. And I think law firms and i include well I, I include my own i'm like i'm speaking from my experience i think we've been lazy because it was too easy when someone sat just over there you could oh, i'm supervising them i can see them i can hear that if they're saying something that's totally off beam on the phone but in reality that was only that was like watching the surface of it and then there's there is an opportunity for us to augment and um develop the value of the way we use those tools and you know those firms which and I'm, I'm fortunate well you know one of the steps we did take some years ago is to shift to an entirely um virtual way of working so we don't have physical paperwork which i think any firm that's not done that yet should that that should be their first priority is to get get rid of paper because that's their biggest impediment to any of the use of these technologies but once you've made that step then the sky's the limit it's not just about location it's about the way we work how we interact with with different levels, how we how we um, interact with the client, how we keep them informed, etc. So it's all all technology that's been here, but suddenly we've got an adoption driver like never before, um, and I think that's quite exciting. Yeah, and I think I think it, uh, the really good point there is is the the risk of 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 the juniors and youngsters not being trained properly by being remote all the time because as you mentioned all of our most of our lawyers are our partner level senior lawyers so so it, it doesn't affect them the, the same way but i do worry if we go to everyone suddenly goes to a fully remote model that a lot of the juniors just they learn from watching their seniors 
behave and not just the 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 typing up of documents but the the interaction with clients their daily reaction to how a client says a certain thing or does a certain thing and that i i I do worry that that's going to get lost they have a greater need to be in the same place with other people i think that's that's really important it's been interesting that in a sense all the dialogue around progress tech um different ways of working have been driven by a fear of of the of the uh, older generations um, uh, around the millennials and the post millennial generations and and trying to keep up with them and in some senses actually now it's probably those guys who are going hang on a second before you before you close the offices and push us out into the you know I still need to go and meet my friends I still want to have a drink after work I, there's an important part of their expectation of the experience of being part of a law firm which um, I think. If if we you know any firm that still sees those uh, that um, homegrown talent as part of their future need to think very carefully about when when they're looking at redesigning the way of working. Great. Thank you, thank you, gentlemen. Um, for for anyone that will criticize us on uh, Twitter or LinkedIn later on, um, just so you're aware, we did have two very lovely ladies that were to join our panel, but they couldn't make it in the last minute. So uh, so I- instead, um, Ed and Charles here were uh, gracious enough to like really support us in this in, in the last minute. So uh, it's not a mano, guys. You know, we, 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 we had it all, all, all mixed, but, you know, things didn't work out uh, in, in the last minute. It wasn't deliberate. I promise. Uh, moving, moving on to the next question, uh, which is related to uh, the biggest enemy of anyone that has ever tried to sell a technology to a law firm uh, <laughs> compliance. Um, are standard compliance practices currently in force uh, adequate to cover the new normal, or do they constitute an obstacle to innovation in this area? I mean. For you, Maurice, I assume that compliance practices haven't really changed uh, much. Uh, no, not, not, not at all. Um, I mean, again, the, the, the joys of an agile business is that we're able to make decisions quickly, but still with due diligence ta- undertaken to, to, to make sure that any products that we're looking at are, are the, the right product, that the data privacy is, uh, is, is done correctly. Um, but yeah, no, it's... It, Compliance hasn't changed as a result of, of COVID, and um, I, I don't know. I mean, Ed might be have a very different view, but I, I wouldn't have thought so. No, I mean, I think I think I largely agree with that. I mean, the reality of it is, we weren't we weren't um, a largely remote business, but we were multi office, um, and you know, lawyers on the go and traveling around the world as well. So you know, we have we had we we probably had three and five um, lawyers in the US at any given time. So, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it just doesn't work to be basing your systems on, on, on being proximate with people who are supporting you. So I think all our systems translated. I mean, I think there is, you know, we've got catch up work to do in terms of making sure now assessing all those systems, making sure that they are um, up to speed. Um, And also we've also had to do some pretty reasonably quick work to, make sure we've done assessments of risk in relation to um to home working and i know that there are lots of technology companies moving to patch up in terms of some of the some of the new issues that are coming out but largely speaking i think um what we had before still still works subject to some some boring techie transition that we had to do very quickly <laughs> thank you thank you for that Ed. and 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 peter have you have you guys at the net documents observed a uh, more streamlined compliance process, uh, people that were sort of uh, eager to uh, push through the adoption a bit quicker than, than usual, uh, the usual kind of circumstance? Yeah, there's some interesting stories there. I, I guess at the end of the day, I always think of this as two categories, rules and tools. And we're sort of in the tools company side of things, um, but you, most of our uh, customers, as Ed and Charles have alluded to, as well as Morris, that they have some um, rules governing uh, fair use and proper use of content. Um, we provide that to our customers as well. But I think the tools side of thing, we've been um, really investing heavily on the on document viewing technology. I mentioned our task module, but document viewing technology. So if if 
companies like Taylor Vessing and others want to go digital, well, you've got to be able to view the stuff in an, in, in an easy way and needs to be uh, facile and, and simple. So I think that's an area that you'll see some initial, some new releases from us this year. So I think that's key. I guess at the end of the day, um, to, to answer that question, customers come to us because we deliver a process that is secure and audited and complies to many uh, operational standards globally. So there's no question about how we operate with customer data. And the second is the investment we made early on is to have the leading edge data encryption. So when you give us content, you can be confident that that content is protected at the highest level of uh, ram randomness, which generates um, um, greater complexities to break that content. So short answer, um, rules and tools, and people are more advanced in some areas and the rules, we're here for the tools. Thank you. And um, I'll, I'll move on to the I'll move on, on to the next uh, question. Um, and I, I would address that more towards uh, Charles and then Ed, actually. So um, considering that you know, in kind of in a, in a process of transition to to remote or now hybrid kind of reality, um, what are the tools that you guys are using to uh, guarantee client uh, privacy? and try and confidentiality in a remote working uh, reality. Who's going first? <laughs> you go first, Charles. You go, you okay. go. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, some of this is um, related to what I was saying earlier. I mean, I, it's it's about we you you still want to be communicating and managing in a way that is is in real time. It seems to me if everything is done by stacking up emails and monitoring inboxes, that that is a dark place to, to end up. So whatever whatever management tools and communication tools we want, we want enough of them to be real time. Uh, everybody has their their favourites, but but the key to me is that at the point when we're dealing with clients and with colleagues, we we can't afford just to indulge in our favourites. We we really need platforms that are sufficiently ubiquitous that other people know how to use them. So everyone's got their stories of when the Zoom schools first starting, everybody working out how to get Zoom to work and how to unmute microphones. Well, we got over that now, right? And we need similar thing with with tech. So that with both clients and with colleagues, we're all sufficiently there that we can put the tool out of the way and just get on with with what it is we're doing and i think there are some that are that are you know i enjoy using as a lawyer more than others uh, and i think if i enjoy using them clients will probably enjoy using them and those that give the nicer experience will be the ones that ultimately we adopt because if you if you impose things on people if you if you if you just try and stick stuff on them that's going to put barriers in the way they're going to find ways around it but but plainly management has become a more tricky task at the moment um, and with more dispersed working that isn't getting any easier so so the tools will be needed but, but my please ones that are nice to use i could name some i mean we've talked about some of this cool but, you know i'm a net documents user i've used it for years plainly i like it but i also greatly enjoy using teams for example um, and for me where these technologies start to merge together so i actually enjoyed hearing that the net documents and teams will be able to be linked shortly um, because that's key i just we don't really want to be going off on esoteric platforms um, and esoteric tools, especially when lawyers and clients sort of move around in different different environments. So I would just hope that they become settled standards that that we can all just leave transparent in the background and use with with confidence. Yeah, I, I'll pick up on um, the phrase you used there, which is you know from a so so I'm not I won't, I won't talk from a technology point of view because I embarrass myself, but. Um, from from a kind of leadership perspective, um, the 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 way um, the mantra I have on compliance is making it easy to do the right thing, because lawyers are really they're bright and they're 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 um, they they're very autonomous and they don't want to be told what the wrong they don't want to be told not to do something and when when you tell them to do it, then they get it annoys them and they don't understand why um, because you haven't invested the time in making them understand why. Then they will just make it their job to get around it, and they will find a way around it because they're like that. Um, but if you actually engage with them, you give them the tools to understand what what those obligations are, why those obligations are in place, what is the what's the overarching issue which we're trying to address, whether it be at a firm wide level or actually, 
even taking them up to the, you know, why why do we have anti money laundering in the in the UK? Let's understand those issues so we don't think of it all the time as being this this thing that the, the government's put in place to just get in our way. And and then then engaging them with the the processes and then the tools, so the technology again, getting back to the um the you know that that characterization um we talked about earlier. I think that then then when they see that this is here to help them to make that easier to get from to address that issue which they now understand um then then absolutely that they work with it and then going to your point about um adoption I think technologists my 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 engagement with technologists is often has been characterized in the past too much by looking for the best the the very best technology or best in breed solution rather than the most usable or the most integratable or the most accessible and sometimes um we have i found ourselves spending money on over featured um applications or we try to implement things that just are too complicated for the users to engage with and that becomes so almost the um the feature level can be a barrier to adoption even if even if one could choose to just use some of them the fact that the, there is a myriad and perhaps the interface offers too much choice and it's confusing that can be a really really bad problem so i think that in terms of it, you know if we use that in the compliance context that's about making people understand that what they're being asked to engage with is there to help them it's to make their life easy and then to make sure that, that experience of dealing with them is really really straightforward really easy really intuitive and and I, I you know in the background i completely see the integration and adoption of fewer very very effective platforms is the way to go and there's nothing more irritating um for a user to find a technology that has all the whistles and bells it doesn't do its core thing 99 percent of the time i'd rather have I'd rather have 10 features instead of 100, but it do, does them all the time. So I can absolutely rely on it. There's nothing worse than, oh, yeah, but this is this can do this can do a video. I'm like, well, I don't really care. I don't, you know, um, is beautiful, obviously, but I don't need to see him in in like scopic detail. <laughs> and, and fundamentally, probably that technology is not going to be supported by my local broadband anyway. So um when, when my daughter goes and plays um on her uh you know on her internet gaming um on the you've got to try to run two 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 eight things so i think it's about you know about keeping it simple keeping it into keeping it into it and making sure that the user understands um how to use the technology and for the compliance that is absolutely the key in my view couldn't, I'm going to jump in there if you don't mind, Peter. I saw you about to jump in, but I was quicker. Um, I have to say that you're absolutely right. I think if you don't, uh, and, and what we've found is is fundamental is, is involving the lawyers in making those decisions and making that those uh, those changes. And and with the single, with keyed in, what we've done is, is it's a one place for them to go. Uh, in in previous firms where you've got four different tools and three of them do the same thing, lawyers just get really confused about which one should I be doing, which one should I be using. So, absolutely right. We we've involved the lawyers so that they feel uh, connected to it, um, and as a result, they then buy in a lot better. And yeah, the usability. There's no point in having bells and whistles for three lawyers when 150 others don't need it. Um, so yeah, I, I have, absolutely have to concur with that. Peter, you're up. I'm just going to um, two quick points. First, Ed, you, you, I love your philosophy to be ruthless as a product um, uh, team guide. You know, in terms of how we're trying to evolve our product, a little bit like Charles is as he looks at our platform and said, "Why is this really necessary?" But the joke or the pot, when you're commenting about internet connectivity and uh, uh, your family's uses. I thought you were going to raise TikTok as a, as a demand on your internet. So anyway, sorry, I couldn't resist that because it's, it's a big ongoing debate in our family right now. Thanks for that. Um, I'll be working, moving on to um, a 
asking the question, what workflow and team management tools would you guys recommend that uh, you found to be uh, efficient in coordinating teams uh, as well as, uh, you know, the process of working around projects? Maybe, maybe over to you, uh, Ed, with that. Have you guys used anything interesting in the last couple of uh, months that uh, it, it's worth mentioning? Before I uh, before I go to 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 the to the obvious winner here, who would be Maurice? Yeah, definitely. I um I think definitely think my daughter must be on TikTok. So if I break up on this <laughs> one, um, uh, the, uh, you know, yeah. So so we we are we are. I haven't got I haven't got um some some really whizzy product insights for you on that. Um, the 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 use we use we use um and and have been using uh interfirm chat around so we use a product called starly for all our internal video conferencing um it's a it's a good product uh it's probably it's probably it came from the adoption came because we we're using it for our internal video conferencing because it's very high definition etc in reality going back to the previous point with more and more we're now we're now zoom um adopters and because clients just go what starly um, and then we just have that whole conversation. So with Zoom, um, everyone's kind of got over the security stuff for using that. But we do have, we it does have a, it has a 365 type capability in terms of chat. Um, we're shifting, we, when we, we when we make the move to the cloud, which hopefully will complete in the next six to 12 months, we will adopt Teams at that point. And we've already made that decision to have it in, integrated in that way. And I think that, that again, rather than it, we, when we have got the internal culture of management of those of matters to a level that justifies investment in specific tools we'll make that step in the meantime i think there's huge progress that we can make with teams with the in the, the chat um the document sharing facilities everything we've got at the moment um uh, and that's that's how we intend to do it so i'll, I'll say nothing more and leave the people who actually know what they're talking about to dig me out but but i think in a way technology is probably sort of the second point it, it's a back to, to ed's point at the beginning around the culture is that if 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 you got the culture of 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 teamwork and making sure that people are working together rather than sort of in silos then the technology is just really going to help um obviously it's still important but if you've got fantastic technology to do these workflows but the culture isn't right and the trust to, to work in those in those teams isn't there then then they're not going to use it and it's not going to be effective so um obviously on our side we've already discussed teams as a as a tool that we use again the the uptake we had skype for business when COVID hit and we were only going to upgrade to to teams probably October, November, and, and we ramped it up and, and rolled it out within about three weeks. And it's been fantastic. Uh, the uptake has been amazing. The number of, even though we are, we were disparate um, right from, from the word go, the, funny enough, lawyers haven't been making many video calls internally and even externally. Um, it was mainly the technology lawyers. But now, yeah, I mean, the very when we first rolled it out, I had uh, the least likely uh, lawyer phone me with a video call within the first half hour um and he was uh in his bedroom and uh, fortunately uh in, in business attire um but it was it's it's people have really embraced it they 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 see the value um and and yeah they love it i'm gonna make a slightly controversial position on the on the That's workflow you mentioned you. work you mentioned workflow in the uh in in the question timo and and i think workflow is a concept that outside the back office in law firms is not yet that in the forefront of lawyers. I didn't think as most businesses would understand it, workflow is anything that lawyers would particularly grasp. And that might be to do with, you know, I mean, on on this call that I, I you know, knowing the sort of firms I do, the nature of the work, if you look amongst some other firms, I mean, my firm for example, is still a full practice firm. So we still do residential conveyancing, wills of probate and that sort of thing, which a lot, a lot of firms now don't do. But there is still a section of law where you have large volumes of processes 
And if I use my wife, for example, who's responsible for a housing stock of about 10,000 houses, which she has the legal work to do with, um, you know, I work on about five or six projects at a time. It's pretty easy for me to manage those in my mind with a few notes and with teams and things like that. They can't do that. You know, there, there are still quite a few lawyers who work in that sector where workflow would really add a lot of value. And I don't think we've yet seen much of that evident in law because um, the, the concept of process systematization and the rigors of some of those things are still quite frankly in its in its uh, infancy in, in many parts of law and i think that will change um and i don't think it's a i don't think it's a threat to lawyers i don't think it's an insult to lawyers i think it will it will support them uh, trying to juggle those things without proper workflow tools is really jolly hard uh, so i expect to see that with something in the years to come we will see more of and if we don't the outsourcers they'll take it away from the law firms and they'll show how it should be done. Uh, so if, if, if the law firms don't get it, there are plenty out there who are quite ready to show them how to do it. I think there are already, oh, sorry, building work next door. Um, I think there are already a few firms that are taking this very seriously and have done some great work. Um, but yeah, again, it's big budget. So it's normally really large firms that can afford to do it at this stage. Yeah, lots, lots about, you know, tasks are an important part of what we're trying to deliver that that sort of middle ground charles um uh so that you can still have some structure but it's not uh the demands that a workflow structure imposes uh hey um just real quick timo there was an interesting question in the uh, chat just about um integration and i think it was made by a couple comments by the panelists about the importance of having tools that can integrate and work together. Uh, so there is some sort of seamless uh, alignment to the work process, whether uh, Ed's comments, and I think keyed in to tie it back to the opening remarks sort of as an example of that integration layer. So I, I guess as a tech, putting the technologist hat on for a second, that's an area as a checklist and a, and a goal that you need to make sure there is an ability to integrate. Teams has done a great job of providing an open framework so that lots of things can come into teams to do that sort of single pane of glass. I worry though, uh, Charles, perhaps that Teams is gonna become the next Outlook, just like Microsoft produced Outlook for email. I, teams certainly seems like it's moving in that direction, but but I digress. So but back to you, Timo. The, the, the thing I'd say about that, I agree with you. Sorry, I agree with you on that last point about the integration and, and you know, I've, I've had um, projects in the past that we've looked at that's, that haven't got past the question, can it integrate with Outlook? Um, and I think the difference is that uh, Teams is intrinsically a cloud-based product and that the, the mentality of providers, I mean, this, this continues to require Microsoft to behave, but um, fundamentally, I think you, you as providers now are coming at this in a much more kind of open source expectation that rather than to stitch us all up with a massive what what is presented as a bespoke um, integration, you would you would naturally do what you're doing, which is to say, actually, we've already integrated with that. We know you're all going to need to integrate with that. We get it, so we've just done it. So it's available for you off the shelf, um, and you know you can tinker with it if you like. But fundamentally, it's there. And my sense is that that's going to become. I hope that that will be more and more the way in which. Um, the cloud will not only drive the, the technology and the ability for, for businesses to integrate, but also um, the mindset to move away from, from the supplier mindset of the past and move to a more open source, future looking um, mindset, which clearly NetDocs is, is demonstrating in the way it's working there. Lots of uh, focus on Teams today. I'm going to revert our bio to Microsoft. Uh. Peter, actually, you were um, you can um, uh, speed up there, there a bit. I, I was quite keen to ask you uh, whether there are any interesting tools currently in development and uh, interesting integrations that are uh, coming on the horizon for net documents. Well, I made thank you for that. I, I made you know tasks. That whole idea of plan um, uh, initiative is so critical to us. That's uh, um, and you'll see some products coming out. I mentioned the task product. Uh, we also will have our new viewer with deep annotations, the support for Microsoft Teams through Chat Link. That's all part of that plan exercise. We're we're stepping not into the workflow world just because we don't think that is perfectly suited. We have great partners, Motor. 
um, and others that support that workflow. And then we just supported, just provided support for um, Microsoft's Power Automate. I'm sure Charles, as a little bit of a techie, probably is touching around in that already. But it's really the simple idea of no code where you can bring together simple automations. Like I want to um, uh, grab a court filing, download it, and I want to now extract some key elements from it and then perhaps uh, post it into that documents, Power Automate to help with that sort of simple workflow um, stuff. And all the e-signatures, we big demand for that. We integrate now. We're going to continue to integrate heavy in that um, area. I did post just kind of a funny app because I'm a, I like following apps in the chat, um, a product from my fellow uh, San Francisco area friend, Phil Libin of All Turtles, a uh, new sort of video broadcast tool called Um Hum. Um, it's got an odd name. It's very San Francisco-like, but the point is it allows you to sort of, as you're doing a video presentation, you can be integrated with the background. So you can now have a much more, almost like a newscaster or a weathercaster experience. So. Um, I'm a pretty big fan of that. I'm not an investor, not related to the company, but uh, it's kind of a fun, fun product. So anyway, that's the off the record stuff, I guess, team up for you. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, do you guys feel that uh, law will adjust to flexible working? I mean, really, would it have a choice? Maybe over to you, Maurice. Uh, it, it doesn't have a choice, and I think it already is adapting. Um, I think, uh, yeah, certainly the technologists have been pushing for this and, and, and saying that this is possible for, for ages. But, yeah, this pandemic has, has obviously been awful in, the, in, the, in a lot of ways and will continue to be so. Um, but in terms of um, its, its value to 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 moving technology forward it's been it's been a, a godsend and and law firms and all businesses are having to adapt as a result of that um and yeah i mean there was a, a, a survey on the uh, fantastic uh highbrow roll on friday recently where um i think it was two and a half thousand lawyers were were interviewed and i think it was 70 percent of them said that if they were forced back into the office they'd be looking for another job so law firms have to to adapt, um, and they are. I mean, it's a classic example where you, you, it, any sort of big change in IT requires some form of catalyst. Uh, it's like electronic filing. You need an office move, or you need um, some event to 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 sort of the lawyers can focus on that. And the lawyers work on deadlines. They they are very deadline focused, and if you've got something to drive people, then then they're going to do it. And obviously that the pandemic is clearly not, and obviously that the pandemic is clearly not a, a great way of doing it, but it has sped that up and and law firms are adapting or, or they are going to struggle in, in my view. Ed? No, I absolutely agree. I mean, I think, I mean, I think, society and and the nation we can't we just can't we can't carry on it wasn't sustainable the way we were living and working and i think um the pandemic is you know not not because of the implications for public health but um you know having crammed onto a train into the city a day after day for a, for a number of years and and you know, increasingly seen the environmental debate rage whilst we do absolutely nothing different there is now an opportunity for us to overnight transition the way we work not not to completely abandon what we did before but to actually go oh, no, hang on a second it wasn't we were making the assumption that we had to do it like that we now know that we don't have to do it like that and there could be a better way what that is we've still got we you know this only time will tell where we settle and what feels right and i suspect that there will be you know different organizations will adapt um, differently and adopt different cultural positions some firms will stay much more traditional in their approach and and they will attract a small number of people you know i would have thought you know the 30 percent who do want to go back to an office will you know may may well find themselves in those firms but i think i think that just as it's opened up a debate it has challenged so many assumptions that i just don't think there's any going back and um and frankly i don't think any of us really think that we want that um we don't want where we are now but but we equally don't want to go back to where we were. So it's it's an interesting um, opportunity, I think, for us to 
make conscious decisions about what the future the future is. And I, I mean, I think we've we've already opened up that discussion within our business, and we've we've always been a business that prides itself on on clarity of identity and strategy. Mm-hmm. But we we went straight away. We could see that that we needed to step back from that and go, hang on a second, everything has changed. You know, everything's the same and everything is different. So we need to step back and say, right, is is the are our priorities, are our, our rate of travel, are all of those things right? Let's engage with our our stakeholders again and ask what's important to them now. What have they what have they understood? And then, you know, we're in that process now of beginning to put that back together again and try and understand what what the opportunity is and and how things could be in the future but it but i agree it won't it won't be the same it will be different how different we'll see charles how different do you think it will be uh i th- i think it's it's almost tried to say it will be different i think it's worth looking at the opposite challenge though which is as individuals we want to be flexible that that's their human nature but a firm has to deliver to its clients and it has to deliver to a set of standards and some of those require a bit of rigor and there has to be a way of stitching things together so they add up to a whole you know if you're going to have um, surgery if you're going to have somebody fly an airplane if you're going to have somebody design a house you, you, you only want the flexibility to go so far you still want to know that the product you're going to get at the end of it is going to be assured and finding a way of letting people work flexibly, but not taking it so far that they lose sight of the fact that actually we're in quite a rigorous business law. You know, there's stuff that we just have to do that's sometimes quite difficult and our individual flexibilities, and I like it as much as the next one, uh, sometimes has to be augmented by help to do that. So I I certainly don't want to say no to the flexibility of course we all want it but there is a challenge to making everybody's individual flexibility add up to a team whole and also you know team working i think will be increasingly important in future and and that technology offers the opportunity to stitch some of it together it's not the only way though but there'll be some new management challenges to do that you know if i'm going to work with a colleague who may only work two or three days a week you know i i would need to to adapt but if i've got a client you know, there's not many clients out there who only want to hear from me two or three days a week. And by the way, I say that as someone who does only work two or three days a week. Um, you know, that that requires a bit of agility, which is not always easy. So that flexibility brings some burdens, brings some responsibilities, and we will need some tools to, to manage it. Surely, uh, sorry. Oh, sorry, from a client's point of view, do you not think, though, that, that, that the frustration they often have with this is our lack of flexibility? Yeah, so, you know the, the the lawyers the lawyers kind of proposition to the market has always been we do these things you know we we're we're here you can come to our office pay a lot of money for us to do something for you and we do it in this way and I think there is there is there are I agree with you there are a whole bunch of challenges you know um, I, I had dark hair before I started running a law firm but fundamentally I think those those challenges. Uh, come from the situation but they also come from our clients and they're going to come increasingly from them to go well actually you know that that flexibility that that you often um, pre- present as not being able to have is just it's not good enough and there are so many competitors you know you, you made the point yourself if we don't if we don't adapt and, and offer um, the the uh, evolution of our service and the delivery of value you know forget what we do now but what we what's the value that we offer to clients and let's work back and say, well, how how could we do that? How could we achieve that same value? You know, informed decisions, managed um, risk, valuable networks. They're the three things I think we sell. Um, we do it through the medium of legal advice, but you know, and and we deliver it in a particular way. Is that the right answer? How else could we do that? How can we break that and rebuild it in a way that works better going forward? I think you know, I don't have the answers and I don't have the magic bullet, but I, I do think it's for every for every negative challenge, there's a positive challenge there as well. I mean, I've got a, a anecdotal example. We I was chatting to one of our lawyers um, at the Christmas party at the end of last year when we were allowed to actually see people, um, and and um, he just finished a, a, a deal um, with a new client, and um, the client had enjoyed uh, the the uh, transaction and said, "Look, I've got a, a box at uh, at the Emirates Stadium. It'd be great to." To, to take you out this has been a couple of months before to go and see a game and he said well I can't I'm based in Israel and and the lawyer 
the, the client had no idea that this lawyer is based in Israel because he didn't need to know because the, the, the service and the value and the, the advice that this lawyer was providing was what the client was paying for, not where he was sitting and, and, and where he was based. So, yeah, I think that flexibility needs to be there and and it can be provided. The tools are there. It's just it's the culture and the, the trust element that it, the trust from the client, but the trust within the firm as well to to trust their individuals that they are working. They don't have to be in an office to be working. I think most firms are over that now, do you think that, that this, you know, the presenteeism thing is I'm sure it exists in some quarters, but. It, it it still does. I mean, I I left uh, Phil Fisher um five five and a half years ago now, and I'd like to think that things have changed, but there was still definitely a very a very present presenteeism was definitely very very prevalent there, um and I don't think it's unique, and, and I don't mean to put Phil Fisher down in any way, shape, or form. It's a fantastic mm -hmm. firm, but it, it's definitely it's definitely there. I'd like to think it's been smashed away in the last four months, but I. I I, I wouldn't put, bet my house on it. Well, I think it's consistent with some of the comments from Terrence and others in the chat about um, it is about trust and it isn't all about technology. I think, Charles, your points are, are good. I just want to raise one interesting thing, and it sort of piggybacks on everybody's comments here, is that we partner with Gartner Research to try to understand the markets and things like that. And, and they produce some interesting research that define four phases and it's pretty obvious consulting work here, but you know the first phase being the re react and respond, and I think everybody's gotten through that, um, understands that it's more fact based about what what are the rules. The next is phase two, which is redirect a new reality. So how do we begin this work? You know, some have done it very quickly. Some of our customers, I commented early, made the transition to our platform uh, in months. Um, and there's a quick transition to Teams and other technology. I think Ed, you're talking about. Um, uh, moving uh, the needle as well. The third phase is where, kind of where we are now, and it's sort of the subject of this conversation of rebounding to the future. So what is the best way to position the business, the demand, the technology, the process to take advantage uh, uh, of this? And maybe some realize that no, there's no, no change. Others will realize there are change. And then the final phase, which is Sort of the area I find quite interesting is the idea, how do we accelerate growth? How do we unlock new sources of growth or processes or approaches uh, that we might not have thought about? And I think both um, um, what Morris has done at Keystone sort of has gotten as ahead of that with the accelerate growth. I think, Ed, you're talking about let's not procrastinate about some of this stuff anymore and really think hard about what our core business is and what are the opportunities. I think that's the beauty of this conversation today and these sort of four phases that sort of moving from phase three, rebounding to the future to really starting to accelerate a growth. We want to be there from a product point of view. I think each of you have a really interesting perspective on what does that mean for the practice of law and, and the process and ultimately some of the tech stack that come to bear. So four phases. I think it's interesting research. Um, um, uh, you might want to look it up. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, and what, something, something to add there. And I've been working with uh, law firms and lawyers for, for the best part of the last seven years. I'm, I'm not a lawyer myself, but I've always kind of figured that uh, when it comes to, to the business of law, half, it's really about servicing, uh, servicing customers, but the other half is really about building relationships. And when it comes to building relationships, so obviously remote work or, or fully virtual kind of environment, um, don't 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 often present the best opportunity to build those relationships. I mean, I I, I take what you what you say more is that you know for for what it was, uh, the lawyer didn't didn't need to be in the same uh, you know city being able to attend that uh, football game with the customer. But you see, probably another ten opportunities may have come uh, out of it. Uh, you know, so there there are surely some limitations to. To the way that we operate as as, as human beings and in fully virtual kind of environment, but uh, feeding of that, um, what do you guys think the main gaps in achieving remote working right now are that cannot be addressed using the solutions available in the market? Are there any? 
Well, there's definitely gaps. You, you, the human element and, and the, the physical contact and, and seeing people and meeting people is, is still very important. And, and, and we have taken that very seriously and obviously pre-COVID and hopefully when, when life gets back to whatever normal will be, that, yeah, I mean, we, we have CPD events on once a month where we have, we run lectures for the lawyers, but then have drinks and, and, and snacks afterwards where the lawyers get to, to, to mingle and, and chat to other lawyers. Um, because with us, it's all about that, as you rightly pointed out earlier, the, the client relationship is all about that personal relationship. So when our lawyers come to Keystone, they've, they've already developed those client relationships with most of their clients. Obviously, they will develop new ones once they're at Keystone. But they the reason those clients come with that lawyer is because of that trust, that relationship that's formed between the, that lawyer and that client. So we try and facilitate the, the trust and the relationships between our lawyers because there's, uh, as you all know, lawyers are very are very specialised in one area, but they always need help in other areas. So if you're an employment lawyer, you're going to need some help in a, in another in a in a real estate uh, practice at some point, but you don't know. Certainly in our firm, if you're all virtual all the time, you don't know which real estate lawyer to, that would gel with you because it's not just about their knowledge. It's about their relationship with you and your lawyer, uh, but also that you're worried that's your golden goose. You don't if I I don't want to give my client to, to, to Peter if I don't know him, don't like him, don't trust him, because if Peter messes up that piece of work, then that's going to reflect badly on me and my golden goose has, has left the nest, so to speak. So. You, you've still got to have the collegiality. It's still fundamental and you have to, to, to do that in different ways and you have to be a lot more um, innovative. It's not just about the technology. It's about those those events and getting the right people. And I mean, we've got 350 lawyers now and they're all very different. So we will have an event at Sing Along Greece uh, for, for some people will be an absolute nightmare for others. Um, a, a, a cricket game or, or, a, or a tennis match will be fine for others, but whereas a, an art gallery will bore some people to, to, to tears. So you've got to try and accommodate everyone and make sure it's inclusive enough that the right people come along and, and everyone's involved. Um, so that's, that's how we do it. I've got a specific gap I think exists that I'd really love to see plugged, but it would have to be ubiquitous. So, which means it's probably going to have to be an Office 365 or something. But, um, you, you know, when you're in the office and you want to chat to somebody, you can just look at across their desk and you can just tell if they're on the phone or if they look as if they've got their head stuck in something or if they're, you know, you can just tell by their body language whether they're approachable at that time to ask a query. That's really hard. Now, I know some tools, you know, you see like Teams makes you go red, yellow, or green depending on what's in your diary but that's not that sophisticated and it would just be nice to aid that interaction while people are working separated to show a way of almost like on a scale of whether you're open to, to some interaction at that time or whether you've got your head down and you need to focus because you know we all have those periods too and I think that would that would aid a bit of interaction because you you know do you send somebody an instant message which is the interruption that they don't want or you know that's or or an email but it would just be if you could just say oh yeah they, you know they're they're showing green at the moment. You know, you don't feel bad about just even phoning for some chat. Whereas if it's orange, you might think, well, it's reasonably pressing. I'll interrupt them anyway. If anyone knows of such thing, but the fact that it's not ubiquitous means it's no good to, you know, it has to be something that whole world, you know, everybody adapts, doesn't it? Yeah. As a, as a, I mean, from, from my standpoint, even though you think I could be put into the, the whole millennial hat, uh, you know, when all of what happened happened, you know, I, I, I couldn't wait to be back in the office. And it's not because I had a, uh, an, uh, you, you know, kids that were um, making me unable to work uh, or, or because I'm, I'm, I'm sharing a, a same space with a spouse that is also working and just getting on our nerves. No, I, I don't have any of that. I'm cohabiting with a cat. Who's, uh, who's fairly calm, but you know, I, I couldn't I couldn't wait to be back, and I couldn't wait to be back because I never really felt that working in the same environment is really about productivity. I think that people are uh, a lot more productive when when working on their own uh, from the comfort of their home. But I, I don't think that you know there is a tool out there that can allow us to to have the banter that we have at the office that allow you to kind of build that build that team, build build that collectiveness, sense of collectiveness, build build a sense of mission. Um, 
and 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 you know that's that's really would be an area that I think technology will really struggle with uh, in one way or another. I mean, it may have been achieved in some futuristic societies like the one in Japan, but um, but but I doubt. But uh, from 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 a technology perspective, Peter, uh, what are the areas that are currently uh, lacking? Uh, innovation that that could certainly be addressed are there any did you guys at net dogs think that you've covered them all no there's such a huge waterfront to to do i think just lightheartedly working on emojis more is kind of important you know you can get your uh, no i think there's two big areas that we're spending a lot of energy on I've, I've mentioned one already which is sort of this work process stuff the other is in the area of learn. Um, you see some initiatives. We announced our a net knowledge product to help with knowledge discovery um, within an organization. But I think trying to un understand or at least provide some guidance around what um, are meaningful documents, what are useful documents in a way that reduces the amount of human time spent on it. It will. It is clearly an imperfect world, but you see some of the recent advances in some of the natural language tools. We're gonna to continue to bring those forward. I mentioned earlier around um, monitor and guide. That's a big part of our learn area where we're gonna be releasing some analytics so that people can understand how are people using the environment so they can monitor and guide in a remote environment where you can't look across the room and understand uh, what's happening. So those are gaps that we're we're uh, investing heavily in and will continue to fill and grow on top of the core uh, platform. So watch for emojis, Charles. That'll help you. <laughs> All right. Well, we're coming uh, coming down to our, our, our last question and uh, just kind of like feed off what I just mentioned earlier. I think that one, uh, one, one area uh, that imposes uh, limitation when it comes to to working from home is is the sense of collective creativity and, and the fact that uh, you have that inability to really bounce ideas of of each other if you're not in the same environment or at least um, you know or at least it's not it's 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 not really the same uh, as as if you are in the same environment but is is it really that? Is is remote working an enemy to to team creativity? Is law creative at all? Is it the creative sector? Uh, over to you, Ed. So I, d I definitely think there's a creative element to to what lawyers do, but there's also there's also huge tranches of what lawyers do that that is 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 relatively process driven and repeat and uh, so I, I think it comes you know first of all that that. What remote working doesn't need to be as an element of the the work style that, that each business adopts. It doesn't have to be a barrier to to being able to work creatively. It just needs to be making sure that when you're together, you you are doing creative and collaborative things, and when you're not together, you're doing the other things. I mean, you know, I I equally pre pre COVID walked around my office with with a which is very open plan and and very you know, built for teamwork and collaboration and you'd get a whole bunch of lawyers with ear defenders on to be able to you know zone in and work at a desk so they can't hear anything so they can work on that document where they just need to be concentrating for an hour so I, I don't think remote working needs to be a barrier to it but in terms of the ultimate right design that will depend on the nature of the work the nature of the firm the nature of the clients that the, the firm is working with I think I think that goes back to something that um, uh, Maurice was saying um, earlier as well about you know how Keystone address what, what was being discussed in the context of networking, internal networking, like the need for that. But but funny enough, in all the conversations that we've had with all our stakeholders, the the key need is human. It's not it's not about the way we work or what we do. It's just because human beings we like to be with each other. And that actually, in terms of getting the most out of our work, we need to know that there are parts of that that will mean that we go to places. And it doesn't even have to be our colleagues. You know, I don't want to be soppy about it, but we just like going into the hubbub of the city and feeling that buzz of things going on. And um, uh, so, so I think I think that 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 will be the primary driver for us to retain some element of personal contact. And if you are 
a business like Keystone, where your model suits a particular type of lawyer working a particular type of way, that will probably be at you know they've still got some they've still got some managed and purposeful contact with each other. That's at one end of the spectrum, and the other end of the spectrum, you'll get businesses which will retain very high elements of sitting in the same room together. But but some you know that in between, we'll all find our place. And the people that come to us and that join our individual tribes will 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 feel an affinity to that. And I think clients their clients will um, uh, follow that. I mean, it's interesting um, from the Keystone perspective. You made the point that the technology lawyers, the the ones who had used, you know, were really natural using the VC, and that probably reflects the fact that the clients are as well. You know, that, that from our firm's point of view, the clients. The clients were like, oh, God, you know, you, you're using VC, you know, welcome to the 21st century. You know, we've all we've been waiting for you. Um, and so, you know, and that's not about that us having the technology. Our, our IT director has delivered all that for us ages ago. But it's just about adoption. It's about us being being there and, and right coming to the party. So but so I think fundamentally, I don't think remote working is a barrier to it because I don't think that we'll, everyone's going to suddenly never have any office element. Are we going to have floors and floors of office space in Canary Wharf with people all sat with ear defenders on um, smashing away at documents? Probably not, not least of which because everyone's fed up with the kind of landlord. You know, it's, it's like a collective finger up to the landlord, isn't it? Because they've all been screwing us stupid for years and now we can get our own back. Any landlords out there? No offense. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what, what about you, Charles? Do you think that remote working is an enemy to creativity, team creativity? Yeah, I think inevitably. I mean, it's, I, I can't. Uh, there, it's not just creativity in the way we do work. It's it's creativity in the sense there are some things you have to discuss where you need other people's viewpoints, and it's really difficult to sometimes not get those face to face a video conference just doesn't just frankly always do it i mean we um we have a friday morning toast in our office you know i quite miss it it's not that i haven't got a toaster at home i have but it's not the same <laughs> um you know and the conversations that go around where people are making toast are not <laughs> conversations that are happening video conference um and the problem with i i, we, I realize we're, we're not going to have a total absence of offices or a totally everybody in or totally everybody out one of the challenges going forward will be if everybody's just there some of the time, which feels like the right thing is, I'd like to be there at the time when other people are there. So we're almost probably going to have to say, right, you know, maybe Mondays will be the day that we you know the whole team will aim to be in or something. Because just turning up and finding out that half the people you'd like to see aren't there or the office is just a bit quiet and dull is not going to be much fun either. So you need a way of recreating the vibe of what happens when everybody is in. So there'll be a bit of a challenge for the managing partners, I think, just to get everybody in on days where they you know and also you 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 feel the the life of a place you know you need to see that you're part of something bigger and if you're in an office with hot desks it doesn't always feel like that i think you need that you need that wider thing of walking i mean you walk onto our floor we've got quite a big open plan floor you know and i don't know how many people on it but you know you can probably see 100 people in front of you you know you realize you're you know you're part of something that's bigger which i think is important yeah, and I think I think it's down to management again. I think you've got to 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 uh, take the pulse of of the business and and of the teams and 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 uh, react accordingly. Um, even in in central office, there's fifty, roughly fifty people in our central office, and and we're trying to work out uh, on board level what we're going to do about the office. To uh, we're clearly not just going to shut it down because we've got meeting rooms that the client the lawyers need for 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 client meetings. Um, but yeah, if we are going to come, some come in one day, others come in others. We're just going to have a have to have a lot more sort of events, for sort of like a a funky Friday type thing where finish it at two and all go go karting or 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 go down to the pub or or do a dance afternoon or something where you're getting people out of their work environment, but you're getting that social element. It's um, got to be something more than just a we work office, isn't it? Really, I mean, it's got to feel more than that. And. I've got a I've got a fair question here from uh, Eva Chrisman. Um, kind of like very much resonates the the, the mood in our regular uh, organization here. I mean, we all know that the the biggest casualties of, uh, of our decision to to shut 
the world down will be ultimately the the young people that are coming out of university uh you know how about educating young lawyers how how do you do it in a remote environment so sure, i've i've got a newly qualified working for for me at the moment so i'll maybe and that's so that's a recent experience for me um and you know it's unfortunate for him that he qualified just as all this was kicking off um mm. so it's you know it's tough um and the reality is it's not good we have to find ways of getting around it we have to make more of an effort to to meet up um he the good news is that he's being you know he's proactive about you know looking for those opportunities so he's not letting it get him down but in reality we do have a responsibility to support these people and and it's more than just about technical training it's about coaching in their career and their aspirations and and letting them uh, grow into what it feels like to be a, a fully functioning lawyer out of training. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a huge challenge, and I and I think that it's not just remote working that threatens it. Some of the you know some of the automate document automation, for example, also threatens it because some of these younger lawyers would traditionally worked on documents that are let's call it more simple to cut their teeth on. Well, if all that simple stuff is going to be automated, some of those things go away, and I think that is a that is a real challenge, and I think we have to be very cognizant of it. Otherwise, uh, we're going to pay a price later on in the you know, when we're short of lawyers who can who can, you know, take their place higher up the proverbial pyramid. So it requires deliberate effort, and it requires recognition that these people are important, um, and that you know, even though it intrudes on my time, my fee earning, and all the rest of it to spend time, you know, there's nothing in it as a sense for me fact is I had the benefit of that when I was junior and sometimes you just got to remember that you got to put back in the system and that is one of the things that law firms always had there was always that understanding and we get rid of that at our peril it's not a factory I mean with our model we have a far fewer sort of juniors um, most of our lawyers are, are sort of partner level but we do have a, a central pod of, of junior lawyers and there's four sort of trainees um, and yeah, they are currently ver uh, sort of based from home, but normally they're in the office. But yeah, as Charles says, it's all about not forgetting about them, making sure that they're involved in whatever you're doing. That supervision becomes almost even more important when when you you haven't got that face to face contact. But yeah, it, it is a worry. It is a concern, and it's less of a worry for our model because we don't have many. But it's something that firms do need to take seriously. And. Uh... So I, I, I totally, totally agree on one level, but I think the danger we have in thinking about this, and I don't, I don't know what the answer is um, implicitly, uh, but that for me uh, is a danger that we, we try and look at what, uh, what, what the future could be by trying to superimpose on it the systems, processes, and ways of working that we had before, and then trying to sort of partly virtualize them and, or virtualize them fully. And in, in reality, my sense is that, um, you know, it is it is a complete change. It was an opportunity for us to just stand back from it and go, actually, how do we do this? You're right. The, the issue of, of developing talent in the business, supporting and, and engaging young lawyers, I think, continues to be um, an issue. And in fact, we, you know, recent recent work we were doing um, around our own thinking about the future included speaking to um uh, uh, in depth in a, uh, to a number of clients and in fact uh, a handful of those asked us how we were going to address the question of how are you going to how are you going to develop your talent in the future i'm i'm, I'm going to want to know about that um so it's definitely an issue but i don't i don't i think there is opportunity for us to look at it completely differently and you, you know look at the way we work the way we think you know for example there is a there is a lot of sense of you know I, I totally agree that there is some some great spontaneous creativity that happens you know the the water cooler conversations um, but but there's also a hell of a lot of wasted time and and like opportunity to you know where where people could be and, and I don't mean this in a kind of oppressive managing partner way you know well, I could get some more billable hours out of them I'm just saying that actually if people want meaningful um work during the time they're at work they want to have some downtime and they want to have some banter with their colleagues but they, they but they mostly want to make a good contribution and i think a lot of particularly non-legal work that gets done which is about working on the business you know like um how do we make the business better how do we get our team better operating better we manage that so terribly you know it's so inefficient 
and and there is that this situation and our need to deal with that is now that it's, it's actually about us saying look I, I these things need to be done so who's going to do them and better objective setting it's better it's better assessment of ideas and um, triaging of ideas and then allocation of responsibility for them all the things that we're super super lazy about when we're all banging into each other in the office oh yeah we should have a chat about x and y but we never bloody do have that chat about x and y because it's too hard and we've got to make a decision so now is the opportunity for us to think well how can we do things differently none of that gets away from the fact that we all want to we want to be with other people and that and the young people need to see how people behave and and interact with us and we've got to think of ways to 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 um ensure that there is that role model still being created but does it does it have to be about straight recreation of physical interaction into a virtual situation or are there different ways of doing that that could be more efficient i think there are answers on a postcard please Thank you, thank you. Ed. Um, we've got a question coming from Steve Sumner, who is actually the director of IT at Taylor. He's asking for a pay rise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to address that one to 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 you, Peter. Um, I mean, what are the solutions for uh, firm wide training uh, under under remote conditions? Is is technology the answer? Um, you know, as a technologies that have been servicing companies like like Keystone, how how do you handle, for example, the training uh, related to the implementation of your product? Yeah, well, we're fortunate to have a, a good partner ecosystem, um, Encore Tech, Affinity, and others. And both those companies, as an example, have developed a pretty rich curriculum that allows them to do spot uh, learning or just in time uh, training. So again, I, in the opening remarks, I commented about a couple uh, customers that onboarded right during the start of the pandemic, and they did that entirely remotely. And again, with uh, reasonable technology, they used to go to webinar to do that training, and it could be then recorded, much like your platform here. Similar platforms have emerged where it can have a good training curriculum uh, to do that. We're working on an overlay to our product, so as new customers onboard, there's a common overlay to the web experience so they can walk them through um, how to get started. So those are two strategies, the partners, and you'll see some overlays from us on um, how to get started. Well, you got anything to add, Maurice? Well, I mean, we've taken on ooh, about 15, 20 lawyers in the last sort of four months that, and we've done all the training for them uh, remotely using Teams and, and um, uh, screen sharing and it's it's not as good as face to face um i, I am honest about that but yeah, it it's good enough and then it's important to then have the support structure in place for them when they've got questions after that because uh, training for uh, we we're very much of the the uh, the belief that training should be relatively high touch uh, sort of high level and light touch so that once the lawyer then starts using the system then they'll have sort of questions and, and then we have the support structure in place so they can answer those questions and at least it's more in context and, and they learn quicker that way. Awesome. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. We've run over time a bit, but we haven't lost our audience. So I assume that we'll <laughs> all asleep. Who knows? Uh, it has been widely useful. Uh, thank you very much for, for taking the time to listen to us today. Thank you to, to us today. Thank you to, to the panel for, for joining us. Uh, some of you on really short notice, I really appreciate that. Uh, I, I, I owe you at, at least a couple of pints, if you, if you guys do that still. Um, you know, we look forward to, to hosting you for our uh, next webinar as well. Uh, in the meantime, make use of some of the materials that, that we, we shared. Apologies for uh, the technical issues that we had at the beginning. Uh, of, of the webinar, but if we didn't have any technical issues, it would have not been a webinar hosted by Cosmonauts. Uh, <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Thank you. All. You have a good evening.